This is the GTN show. Now we have a big topic to discuss this week. And that is, have Iron Man made a big mistake? <laughs> and not just in one way, because we have a couple of things that we're gonna be picking apart from Iron Man this week. Yeah, we also have Alistair Brenly teasing us with whether he perhaps is aiming for Tokyo, Kona, or maybe both. We've got an insane new pool design and we have a ton of racing from the weekend. Well, first things first, we are missing Heather this week because she is currently on her way back from South Africa. Yeah, and we imagine that she's gonna be a little bit ginger on her legs today because this past weekend, she just completed the Comrades Ultra Distance Marathon in South Africa, which is a heck of achievement, isn't it, Mark? It is, I mean, this, Ultra marathon is just shy of 90 kilometers, 86 kilometers. Now this is a pretty famous marathon in South Africa. Now they actually rotate it from year upon year. So one year it will be uphill, the next year it will be downhill. And we're not talking crazy steep hills here, but it's still significant over the course of 86 kilometers. Yeah, this was the uphill year this year. So it started in Durban on the coast, so sea level, and then wound their way up to about 3,000 feet in altitude at uh, Peter Maritzburg. So that's a constant um, eight hours and 15 minutes to took Heather. So that's incredible achievement, but it's a lot of time to be on your feet, isn't it? It is. Well, Heather absolutely smashed it. And here she is, catch up on it. Hey, thanks guys. As you can see, I'm enjoying the last little bit of sunshine still out here in South Africa. I've actually made it up to Joburg, but I am proudly wearing my finishers t-shirt and I must admit I earned this one, but most importantly, I earned this. It might be a tiny medal, but there was a huge amount of effort. Um, just quite an incredible experience and it was so much harder than I expected. I got the Bill Rowan medal, which is basically between seven and a half hours and nine hours. I did it in eight hours, 14, and it was pretty much eight hours and 14 minutes of, of struggle. I haven't got time to explain it all now and I've never been so emotional when I finished. I, I couldn't actually stop crying. I can't explain it and my legs are already starting to forget the pain, but I can still feel that moment of just getting to that finish line and I never believed I could run 87k until the last 10 meters and it is the most amazing event in South Africa. I was really privileged to start at the front with the elite runners and I felt so out of place. It was incredible but it turned into being an amazing race. We actually saw the record get broken. A 12 year record was broken by 10 minutes by Gerda Stein, a South African in an incredible time. She ran a 5 hours 58 53 seconds, I think, just amazing. So to be part of that race, it was the uphill year. So basically we ran, I think, almost 2000 meters uphill in 87K and yeah, my legs are feeling it, but South Africa know how to put on an event and I'm still getting goosebumps just talking about it again now. It was incredible, but I'm still looking forward to coming back and telling you guys all about it. But um, yeah, I'll try and bring some of this lucky sunshine back with me. Right, thanks for that, Heather. That is really good stuff. And we're looking forward to hearing all the details when you get back here to the office. But talking about the comrades, and South Africa and everything to do with that. Well, we're delighted to have James here with us and you grew up watching the race, didn't you? I did, yeah. I grew up in Peter Maritzburg and I uh, grew up dreaming of, of, of being a professional comrades runner. Um, ended yeah. up with the triathlon. Ended up with triathlon and I don't regret it at all. I don't think I would have been running the paces those guys are running these days for 87 Ks. Uh, but yeah, still firmly on the bucket list, the comrades marathon. Now, why are you across in Europe at the moment? Uh, doing a couple of races. Uh, a little bit different season this year for me uh, to in the past. I won't be spending the whole Northern Hemisphere summer in, in the Northern Hemisphere um, with Jody at home with an 18 month old and uh, twins on the way. Uh, things are changing a little bit for us and staying a bit closer to home. But yeah, this is one of my, my few Northern trips to, to do some races. Brilliant, well, we thought, well, given the opportunity having you here, we'd take a little discussion over the Ironman World Championship Pro qualification process. Now, we spoke a while back with Susie Cheatham prior to the 2019 season about how it might influence and affect the pros, but we thought we'd actually get a pro in now. Now we are well into the season actually hear how it actually is affecting them. Well, yeah, I think now we've finally been able to see a lot of it was predicted, um, but yeah, now we're getting into the nuts and bolts of the season, a couple of months left of the qualifying, uh, and you've seen people who are both benefiting from the new slot system, the new old slot system, I should say. Well, yeah, could you quickly mm, just recap? Can you just system. quickly recap on what it is for those out there that may not know how it's changed? Yeah, I mean, originally, uh, before I think it was 2010, maybe mm -hmm. 2011, they changed it. Uh, this was the system. You same as the age groupers. You have a certain number of slots at a at a race. It was the same for the pros. 
you finished in the top two, three, and you got your slot, you went to Kona. That was always the, always the system. Uh, and there were some issues with that system. And so they changed it. They changed it to a point system, the KPR. Uh, and for a few years, that was that was the system, and obviously there was a lot of grumbles and groans when they did that. Uh, well, I think and the problem. You're right, because that was the last time um, that uh, 2010 that the old system. And I got a slot for my first time to Kona that time, and I think I remember the field was like 80 men. I think the fields were just getting too big, weren't they? Yeah. As Ironman rolled out more races around the globe, so there was more slots at yeah. each race. And it was a way of of having 50 slots that were spread out on points and and. It uh, doesn't matter how many races you do, there'll still be 50 slots. Um, and then, they, yeah, they changed it to KPR, and obviously for a few years, that was uh, getting used to it and, and figuring out the system and how to uh, how to make sure you qualify every year. Uh, and I think just as all the pros were getting a handle on that, uh, last year they announced uh, that they're changing it completely, <laughs> again, back to the old system yeah. and its slots. Um, the reasons for that, your guess are good as mine. Well, I guess um, there is... There, we, I mean, there is a touchy subject, but with the equality with the women and the men, there has always that has always been a discussion. Whether yeah, because there wasn't fifty and fifty slots, and that was a big drive for there to be fifty female slots in the now old KPR slots. And, and I guess this kind of you know it it, it works with the amount of men that are in a, a pro race versus the female. Uh, yeah, the slots are now allocated depending on the field size, the starting mm. field size. So if there's twice as many men as women, then the unallocated slots, so they have one for men, one for women, and then two unallocated slots mm. will go to the bigger field size. Uh, so yes, it's a way of, I mean, the cynics in us would say it's a way of uh, getting around the whole equality <laughs> on, on Kona Pier thing. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I don't yeah. know. To be honest, that's the biggest issue, I think, is that we don't know. Yeah. We don't know why they changed it, and we don't know, uh, we won't just, we won't. But that aside then, how is it actually influencing and affecting the pro field? Well, yeah, I think that's that's obviously now we're, we're seeing it. Uh, we're seeing guys like Matt Burton, who uh, I think he got third or fourth this weekend uh, at Cairns, uh, missed the slot by one spot yeah. for the third time yeah. this season. And so an incredible athlete, like, probably someone that yeah. you, know, you could maybe see in the top 10 at Kona. Yeah, I think he's got two thirds yeah. and a fourth. Uh, yeah. And he's uh, he's missed the slot by one position on each of those. And on the previous system, that would have been guaranteed yeah. he was in. On this system, he's missed the slot to Kona. And now he's looking at either doing a fourth Ironman before doing a fifth Ironman at Kona, yeah. or just trying quite a far, or just going, I'm not going to Kona this year. Um, and that's that's disappointing for our sport, I think, to see a, an athlete of that quality not lining up at Kona. Um, and then on the flip side, you may have, maybe have someone that's Cherry picked a race somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. You know, far afield that not many pros are going to. No one showed up, or the people who did show up uh, ha already had their slot somewhere else, uh, and they've got straight into Kona. Maybe not even intending to get to Kona, and they've gone. Hey, you've got a slot, and they go, "Whoa, I wasn't even trying for yeah. that, but hey, I'll take it." I mean, you just um, brushed over the last time that you did this slot allocation. Well, it actually really benefited you. Uh, I'm in South Africa with Marino Van Hoonacker. Yeah, well, I'll say, I'll say, it benefited me, and maybe it didn't benefit me because, uh, yeah, in my first year as a pro in 2009, I, uh, I uh, got second to Marino Van Hoonacker, which was a surprise result for me. I just started training with Brett Sutton and. I got second, I was a good 15 minutes behind him, yeah. but I was second at Ironman Austria. And they said to me, you've got your slot, you can go to Kona. And uh, I was not prepared for that. I did not think that I should even be doing that, um, but I couldn't really pass it up. It was yeah, an opportunity to go to Kona in my first year as a pro. So I went uh, and I got thoroughly beaten uh, yeah. by the girls even. <laughs> <laughs> so I probably had no business going there, and uh, but I got that slot and, and we're seeing that again now. I think you, you've got some, some guys who have got lucky uh, and some guys who have got really unlucky, like a, a Matt Burton. You, you know, people have shown up and finished ahead of him who or didn't have their slot and wanted it. Um, yeah, it does make us think, though. It's, 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 I mean, it's, it's a perfect example of the system not working for Matt, unfortunately. You'd be, yeah, you'd I be think the issue, to... the issue that, that we have to say is that it's coming down to the word I just said, luck. Mm -hmm. And you don't want at any point there to be luck in the qualifying for Kona. Um, that, that's what you want to avoid, that's what you want to eradicate. And the point system did a very good job of that because you could have a bad luck race and it's very unlucky you're going to have four bad luck races or three bad luck yeah. races um, and you could still qualify. Um, whereas now you could have 
bad luck and and just miss it. Yeah, I guess ultimately we want to see the best athletes lining up in Kona. Yeah, and absolutely. There's, there's a chance we may not see some of the best that should be there. <laughs> which is so a we wonder if our men are starting to think, have we got this wrong? Are we going to have to have an iteration and make things a little bit differently next year? Who knows? Well, yeah, we'd love to throw this to you guys. So literally asking, have Ironman made a mistake? Should they revert back to the old point system and throw that to a poll? Simple yeah. yes or no, and you can do that by clicking just above Fraser's head. I think we should have a middle a middle selection, which would be in between the two, which is what I think is the solution. Is a slot for winning a race, uh, and the rest of the, 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 the remainder of the of the slots on, on points. Yeah. So there you go. Well, there we go. There's an extra one. <laughs> Right, well, it was really good to get James in there. Um, he's had to scoot off though, because being a proper athlete, he actually has training to get done with the rest of his day. Uh, but we were talking about the poll there, we finished on it, and last week's poll, Heather asked, what is your ideal bucket list race? Yeah, we had some good selections for you to pick from. Now, Abjuez came in in last place with just 11%. Which Cracking race though. It is a great race. Well, I've not done it no. though, but um, heard great things about it. Uh, fourth place was Other with 12%. Third went to Escape from Alcatraz, which just took place at the weekend. Uh, second to Challenge Roth with 18%, and then the winner was Kona Resounding with 40%. Yeah. yeah, I guess it is kind of your ideal bucket list race, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Now, we did get some great um, comments coming in about the other races. Now, mm. Cartel said the Ertelö World Championship, so that's the Swim Run World Championship which I've done. Um, not really triathlon, but related and totally lives up to the myth. Yeah, and then Omar Lee came in with Ironman Kalmar in Sweden. Huge crowd support and the whole town goes nuts. I'm doing it in August, my first triathlon ever, so that's on my buckles. Now I have heard that Kalmar is an incredible race. I wish I'd managed to go and get yeah. it done. So yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I heard good things about that. Michael LeConte, he said, Ember Man. Now that is a great race. Actually, James is going to be doing Ember Man. He's, he's won it? He has won it, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's an amazing bike. I've even raced in Ember and I can tell you that it is hard out there. Um, Jamie Diaz said New York, uh, Cebu, uh, is, did you say it's Cebu? Cebu, 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 Cebu. Cebu yeah. Um, Alcatraz is another one. It's a good little, there. good list there, isn't it? And then to finish off, we have Manon who said the Swiss Man Extreme, if ever learned to swim somewhat decently, yeah, uh, decently rather. Um, yeah, these extreme Ironmans are really quite topical these days. Um, got one coming on myself, but we'll talk about that soon <laughs> enough. Well now for the triathlon news and staying on the subject of Ironman and things that they've done, maybe in a mistake as well. Um, we are now talking about the Ironman World Championships for this year, 2019. And this particular thing is actually with the regards to the swim start. Yeah, and the swim start is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most iconic images of Ironman Hawaii, that cannon going by the pier and everybody flooding out into the water. So you've got the male pros going first, then you've got the female pros, and then the age group races would go after with the males and then the females shortly after. But this year, Ironman have decided that, you know what, we're gonna break that down into waves. And including the male and female pros and the hand cycle division as well, we've got um, 11 wave starts going in total. I believe so, so every five minutes, so it will start with the male 18 to 39. So that's a big that's lump a big together, lump isn't it? Together. Yeah. Then at seven o'clock, five minutes later, they got the male 40 to 44, then male 45 to 49, 50 plus, 18 to 39 female. It just goes on like that every five minutes. So we're not going to get that massive mm. mass start that we are just so used to seeing. And, and for me, that's that like really makes triathlon for me and that niche for the Ironman World Champs. But what Ironman are trying to do in their defense is they're getting under increasing, or have been under increasing pressure over the last few years because drafting has become such an issue and we've seen these enormous packs forming out on the Queen K Highway of, you know, tens and tens up to, you know, possibly a hundred athletes getting squashed into groups that, you know, the vast majority of them, they really don't want to be there. And it causes all sorts of um, issues and um, yeah, just problems for athletes who want to contest uh, drafting penalties that they don't feel that they should have been in a position to get in the first place. So Ironman are hopefully trying to spread the field out and then alleviate a little bit there. Yeah, they? but obviously getting away, get, getting rid of something that is really quite special for the race. So we'd love to hear from you guys as to what you think about this. So equally do drop your comments in the comment section below. So next up in our try and use is Alistair Brownlee, two-time Olympic gold medalist, entering an Ironman. So we have finally seen him pop up. There's been rumors that he would want to do it over the last year or two since he won his gold in Rio, but here he is finally on the entry list for 
the new Iron Man in Cork in Ireland at the end of this month, which, you know, is brilliant news because now if he goes ahead and wins that race, because there'll be one slot available for the male pros, then that means he'd be qualified for Hawaii. Yeah, there's a lot of questions flying yeah. around at the moment as to what he's planning to do. I mean, I think at one point we were like, yeah, he's definitely going down the long distance scene and he stepped away from IT racing. And then he just went and won the European champs and showed <laughs> actually he's in great shape for the short distance racing. Maybe he didn't go quite as he planned, but um, it obviously showed that he's still got this Olympic dreams in his mind and he's still after that. But then on the other hand, he's going after Kona. So I guess we're, we're left wondering what route he's going to take. So it's going to be interesting the next, um, and, and, and that being aside, um, World 70.3 champs at the end of this year, should he win that? That gives him a automatic qualification for Kona. So there's all sorts of options potentially available to him if he goes and does well. A lot races. of speculation. <laughs> yeah, we love some speculation. <laughs> well, we've now got a couple of techie bits, but with a slight difference. Now we've got Skoda, first off, and they've just launched or released their Karok Velo car. Now, this is quite different, isn't it? Yeah, so Skoda have um, taken 1,500 active riders and surveyed them to say, what would you like out of your ideal car? Give us your wish list. And they've gone to town with the answers from this, haven't they? Because the standout thing that we have both laughed about here is the fact that it has a washing machine in it. <laughs> yeah, and that's not it. I mean, we've got I mean, washing yeah. machine, pressure washer, because obviously you'd want to wash your bikes. And they've got the water in the car anyway. Yeah, so. yeah, and then you've got your fridge for all your bottles so you keep them cool. And then if you had to do any maintenance on your bike, you've got a little pull out maintenance set with lights all around the bike in case it's dark at the end of the ride. And another thing that I think is great is a lot of the riders said that they were wanting something really easy to store their bikes on top of the car afterwards, so you can do that. Two bikes I think it can take. Yeah, well actually it's got two types of storage, so you've got oh. In car and out of car, so you've got the exterior storage, so on top of the um, car or at the back on the rear boot. But then also a proper like storage ah, system that you can like lock the bike into, so really really safe. Fascinating. And just in case you really like to take photos <laughs> and use a drone, they've this got a the magnetic bit. landing pad on top of the car for your drone. And then of course you want to upload those photos. Yeah, of course. So they've got Wi-Fi in the car as well. And it sounds like, I mean, we're just scratching the surface with some of the features in this car. I mean, they've actually made this as well. They haven't just like listened to the survey response and gone, oh, that's cool. Yeah, we'll maybe do a couple of them. They've actually just done them all. Do you think they might want to send us a little test drive? Yeah, that might be good idea, actually. <laughs> um, well, now moving on to another very cool bit of, well, tech, I guess you call it. Now, this is the world's first 360 degree infinity pool. Now, this is, just a concept, it's not actually out yet, but they are talking about trying to get it ready for 2020. Now the idea of this is you're literally, well, what they've done is they've actually designed a hotel around the pool. So they haven't designed a pool, uh, sorry, designed a hotel and then gone, ah, yeah, we should probably put a pool in there. They've actually gone, you know what, we want the pool on the top and let's make the hotel work around that. I mean, I get that from an absolutely incredible um, 360 panorama viewpoint. It's in London, right? Oh, that's, that's right, so that's what they're planning. Incredible views of the cityscape and um, that's fine, but I'm not entirely sure that's the safest place to have a swimming <laughs> pool because what if something goes wrong up there? I know, and also you're swimming along and you literally can see through, I think it's three no, 220 meters high you are and you look through the whole hotel down to the floor as you're swimming along, and then obviously you're 220 meters up in the air. So hang on a minute, how do we get in and out of this swimming pool? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about this bit. Now they say that there's like a submarine hatch <laughs> that you like go up some stairs and climb. I, I don't really get it, but Compass Pool said, you know, they're, they're trying to make it happen by 2020. They haven't got an exact location confirmed yet, but I'm very excited to see it. It's a lot to build in a year, isn't it? <laughs> Right then, time to take a look through some of the photos that you guys send in to us. And we've got a fantastic one to start off here. We've got one from Joseph. This is his Argon 18 E119 Plus tri bike. And this is at the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Yeah, which is very topical because we just had the uh, Escape from Alcatraz um, Olympic distance or nearly Olympic distance triathlon this past weekend. We're not sure if Joseph raced, but either way, he's he, right there in and amongst he, he it. He does say that he was on the escape from Alcatraz bike course, but then he does say he was just escaping from work, so uh, he may just live around there and just fancy lucky, it as they uh, lucky guy. Out. But yeah, very nice location to be riding. 
Um, next one from Julia, and this is a Airstream TT1, but at the Adidas headquarters in Germany. Yeah, because that's where she works. So she was getting her um, bike set up and ready to go to the Switzerland 70.3 in Rappersville um, en route from work. So she's all set up in front of one of the very exciting looking buildings that they seem to work in there yeah. in Adidas. Very she said cool. it's, she thoroughly enjoys working there. Great campus, great buildings. I can imagine. Yeah, I think yeah. it would be pretty interesting stuff. Uh, next one uh, is from Thierry, um, and this is his Canyon Ultimate CFSL uh, with Astrid. Stereo on wheels, Shimano 105, and I believe you've actually cycled here. I have. Well, I've not ridden very much in the Alps, but I have been to the top of the Col de Galibier. So he has made his way to the top of these stunning five-meter snowbank walls, and he says that the road's still close to uh, traffic. So it was just him, and apparently the groundhogs for company. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so I imagine it was a bit chilly out there, but wow, worth it for the views. So great, um, great picture. Yeah, um, and please do keep sending in loads of your photos, pain caves, race shots, bikes, race ready. Whatever it is, use our photo uploader. Well now for the race news, and this week we are going to mix things up a bit. We are starting with the Xterra results from Xterra Belgium. Now in the men's race, it was Jonathan Chatton and Carl Shaw that led the swim out with a small 10 second buffer over a small chase group. But then actually a minute 30 further back, we had the defending Xterra Belgium champion, Francois Carloni. Now, it was Carloni, Filippo Rinaldi, and Yere Luxem that actually set the pace really hard onto the bike. And then it's Luxem that came into T2 in the lead, posting the second fastest bike split of the day. And he managed to maintain that lead to take the overall win. It was Arthur Serreras that posted an astonishing run split to come through to take second. And then it was Filippo Rinaldi that came through to take third. Then on the women's side of things, we had Nicole Walters from the UK who did what she often does and led out of the water. But soon after that, it became Morgan Roux from France, her show to steal. She posted fastest bike ride of the race, fastest run of the race, to go on to take a nearly 10 minute commanding victory over second place athlete from Italy, Matilda Balzan. And in third, compatriot to the winner was Camille Defer from France. Well, another race this weekend, we had Escape from Alcatraz in San Francisco. Now, Ben Canute took his third title there after a rather disappointing race last weekend at the championship in Slovakia. Now, he did that by beating ex-professional Joe <laughs> Malloy. Now, I say ex-professional, I'm guessing he's kind of professional again yeah. as he's in a professional race. But anyway, um, and then in third place, we had Josh Hamburger. Yeah, in the women's race, it was Australian short course specialist Ashley Gentle who took top honours on this race course again from Lauren Goss from the US, who's also very good at these types of races in second place, and an old veteran, old hat, I guess, at these types of races, Sarah Haskins Khartoum in third. Well, now over to the ITU side of things, and we had WTS Leeds at the weekend here in the UK. Now, it was Henry Schumann that led the men's race out with the likes of Alistair Brownlee, Johnny Brownlee, and Javier Gomez hot on his heels. And with some of the faster runners like Alex Yee and Mario Mola a little bit off pace, I think Mario Mola is about 48 seconds and Alex Yee about a minute off. But onto the bike, I mean, it was attacked left, right, and center. Johnny Brownlee attacked quite early on with Martin Van Riel and Jonas Schomburg joining him. And then we had Tom Bishop launching an attack and then later into the bike, Johnny again attacked. Yeah, so by the time they hit T2, the race was essentially wide open. We had some fast danger men, the likes of Richard Murray from South Africa, we had young Alex Yee from the UK, and Mario Mola, um, roughly a minute down. So still in the hunt, perhaps not for the podium, but definitely for the more minor positions. But once we hit that uh, run course, the Brownleys dropped off and it really became a five horse race, the likes of uh, Javier Gomez, Matt McElroy from the US, Sam Ward from New Zealand. We also had Jacob Burstwistle in there from Australia. And really it all came down to a stretched out sprint over the last mile or so with Jacob Burstwistle taking his maiden victory at WTS level. So in second place, we had an excellent first podium at this level for Matt McElroy from the US. And in third place, another podium for the war horse himself, Javier Gomez from Spain. Yeah, and now over in the women's side, we had Jess Limonf leading the swimmer, which we're getting quite used to these days. And she was joined by a few other athletes, including the US duo of Taylor Spivey and 
Katie Seferas. Now, that Lee group of six worked incredibly well together to establish a one minute 40 buffer by the bell lap on the bike over the chasers. Yeah, and by the time they got out onto the run, really it boiled down to a three-way race between Jess Learmouth of the UK, Georgia Taylor Brown also of the UK, and Katie Zafferes, who has not been beaten this season until this weekend. So we had Jess Learmouth taking a great third place in Leeds. We had second place going to Katie Zafferes and a fantastic first victory at this level for Georgia Taylor Brown. Well, we have loads more results to talk about now, so we are going to rattle through them a little bit now, starting off with Ironman Cairns. Yeah, it's a big Asia Pacific Championship race down there in the Southern Hemisphere, and we had defending champion Braden Curry absolutely going to town in the field. 20-minute victory, or nearly 20 minutes over, Tim Van Berkel of Australia, and third going to his fellow countryman, David Dello. Not easy athletes to put 20 minutes doing <laughs> either. Um, on the women's side, it was Teresa Adam that took the win over Sarah Crowley in second, and um, Kaiser Sally in third. So so again, yeah. very tough competition to beat there, so very impressive. Uh, we also had Ironman Boulder, which was won by Matt Hansen, Kenneth Pettersson in second. Which is a rookie result, which is very impressive. And Tim O'Donnell in third. And the women's, it was Lauren Brandon that took the win over Leslie Smith in second and Danielle Mack in third. And then we had a whole host of 70.3 events with Ironman 70.3 Staffordshire being first on our uh, radar, wasn't this it? This is an exciting one, actually. I mean, we had Will Clark on the start list there, which we, I guess we kind of thought might take the win. He's in incredible shape. We did have Elliot Smiles there, who's the defending, defending yeah. champion. But it was the young rookie, George Goodwin, that took the win, which yeah. is very good, over Will Clark in second and Elliot Schmelz in third. Yeah, and then onto the women's race. We had first pro win, very exciting for Lucy Charles in her home country. She hasn't raced at that level since she turned age group a few years ago, really. So fantastic win for Lucy Charles. In second place, we had Emma Pallant. And to round out a UK clean sweep of the podium at Staffordshire, we had Katrina Rye. Yep, uh, now over to Ironman 70.3 Eagle Man, which was actually made a bike run due to, well, the chop on the water and the weather conditions. Too windy to swim. Yeah, which is quite odd when it's a lake swim and it's got so much chop on yeah. it. But yeah, it is what it is. Now that was won by Joe Gambles on the men's side and Danielle Dingham on the women's. Yeah, and then we had one other 70.3 to get through uh, this weekend, which was in Japan, Ironman 70.3 Japan, which was won by Kevin Collington on the men's side and Courtney Gilfillan on the women's. So now we're moving on to caption comp, and well, we've got a rather funny picture here that um, you're quite familiar with, because it's you with Patrick Lang last weekend at Challenge Summer. Now, he wasn't there to race, but it does look like he was there. Yeah, I mean, we were we were actually just getting out of the car at the time and looked over the shoulder and thought we took a double genuinely take. thought we'd seen Patrick Lang at hang on, very very still there yeah. and um, yeah, so someone obviously got a little cut out of him, but we did think it'd be funny just to get a photo with him. Um, but yeah, we got some fab uh, captions coming in in the comments. Um, so Yannick said, "Mark has to get his interview game together. Patrick seems pretty bored." And then Matt Dion replied, "I think Mark did a fine job. It was Patrick <laughs> who came across a little flat." Um, um, yeah, then we've got Fat Bloke on a Bicycle said, Mark was disappointed to discover that his recent interview with Patrick Lang was cut out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Robert Nastassi said, Mark, cut it out. I'm bored answering your tech questions. Pretty uh, true, actually. And then, yeah, tell me about it. And then a final one, Joel Stover says, tell us, Pat, from your professional experience, how does it feel to be stood up? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I don't know which one of my favourite one is there, actually. They're all pretty good, but we need to pick one. Uh, Go for it. I'm going to go for the cutout one, actually. I'm going to go fat bloke on a bicycle. Um, so, yeah, if you want to get in touch over Facebook, a cap is all yours, and we'll send that out to you. But now for this week's caption comp photo, and it's actually from the WTS race in Leeds, and this is actually the women's winner. This is Georgia Taylor-Brown getting ready for <laughs> the swim start. It's as if somebody had told her, you're going to win today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, we'd love to hear your captions, so please drop them in the comment section below. Well, that's it for us. Another week of the show done and dusted. It was really cool to have James in and get his very experienced opinions on all things Ironman, wasn't it? Yeah, very insightful. Um, yeah, fab to have him in, actually. Um, now, if you would like to head on over to our shop, we've got loads of new stuff, actually, in there now. So we've got some run stuff. We've also got some new swimming stuff coming very soon. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Also, obviously, our new swim caps, which are nice and bright. Um, if you have liked today's video, then please do hit that thumbs up button. And if you'd like to see more from GTN, hit that globe and you'll subscribe to the channel. And if you want to see a video that we did about running with power, well, you can find that here. 
And if you'd like to see our run progression video, then you can see that by clicking just down here.